You're listening to the Sketchnote Army Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Rohde, the author of the Sketchnote Handbook and the Sketchnote Workbook. And this is the podcast where I chat with sketchnoters and visual thinkers and try to understand what makes them tick. This episode of the Sketchnote Army Podcast is brought to you by Paperlike, a screen protector for the iPad that makes drawing with the Apple Pencil feel like paper. Paperlike's NanoDot technology offers the paper-like friction you want with the clearer screen visibility you need. This new surface even improves drawing precision and reduces arm fatigue. If you're frustrated with the slippery, shiny glass of your iPad screen, try Paperlike. The Paperlike feel on my iPad Pro screen was a game changer. I won't use my iPad Pro without one. It's the closest you'll get to paper on a digital screen. Buy yours today at paperlike.com slash sketchnotearmy. And now on with the show. In this episode, I have a fun discussion with my good friend Dave Mastronardi from New York City, a seasoned practitioner in game storming and group facilitation. Learn more about his entry into visual thinking and how game storming grew and why he feels it complements sketchnoting perfectly. Hey Dave, how you doing? It's uh, good to have you here with me. Hi Mike. It's good to see you on Saturday morning. Thanks for thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah, we're I'm excited to have you on because as listeners will know, um, we like to have sketch noters and people that are really narrowly focused on that space, but we also love to have people that are on the periphery or on the edges. Although I wouldn't say, I'd say game storming is, there's lots of overlap between sketch noting and visual thinking and game storming. So I'm excited to have you on and maybe there's some people out here that aren't as aware of game storming and I would love to make them aware so they could explore it and see how the two worlds interact with each other. Yeah, they go they go very well together. Uh, I think if you're, I don't know if if, if you are a sketch noter, um, those skills transfer beautifully into game storming. And if you're a game stormer, I think you're always looking for new ways to represent work visually. And so dipping into the sketch noting world and taking a deep dive there is only going to make you a better game stormer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like uh, chocolate and peanut butter; they go well yeah. together. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Uh, obviously, we know you're related to game storming, but I'll let you kind of get us into both where you, what you do now and then how you got here. Yeah. So it's been 10 years, really, when I think about the, the journey hmm. to where I am now. And that's when I was working at an agency in Austin and I was doing strategy work, which involved putting a lot of text on slides and the agency um i was working at acquired explain mm. uh dave gray's agency mm-hmm. uh that's where james mcanufo was working too mm-hmm. and I, I i can't remember the exact date but i think we acquired them in july of 2010 hmm. which is 10 years ago uh that was also the same month i'm also going off memory here if i look at the publication date of game storming hmm. right so the book Lots happening. Yeah. So game storming is 10 years old. Uh, the, the, again, the book. And I say that only because the, game st- the things in game storming, those activities, those practices, that's what explain we're doing right. internally, right? So they essentially published their internal handbook mm. as game storming. So all of a sudden, I had... I call them capital C creatives and visual thinkers as my colleagues. And as somebody who I didn't go to art school, I, I, I always considered myself to be lowercase C creative. But when I saw how they worked and I started reading the book, it immediately spoke to me as the, the recipes for all of the things that my professors and my bosses has, had wanted me to do. Like this was the... This was the behind the scenes of how to do those things. And so I dove right into it. You know, I was taking notes on how my new colleagues were working and started to incorporate that into the work I was doing with my internal teams, uh, with customers. But I think it also works really well for individual heads, heads down work. As you can see behind me, um, there is a wall with lots of sticky notes and mm-hmm. yep. um, in drawings for those uh, if this is if this is audio only right now. So um, it really changed the way I work. And 
not only did I feel like with my teams, were we being more productive, but we were also having a lot of fun. Uh, there was a lot of team building um, that that would go on in these in these game storming collaborative visual thinking sessions. So then I, I left um, the country in 2015 and I left, I left the job, but I took game storming with me, right? And mm -hmm. the practices. And when I came back to the States, I left my job overseas and I called Dave up to get the roster. I wanted to start consulting and get kind of back up to speed in the, in mm -hmm. the States. And I just wanted to see if I could get on the, the, the bench, the consulting bench at Explain. And we talked about game storming and, you know, what we might be able to do with, with game storming. And that turned into, you know, the game storming group, which is what I refer to as the services arm of, of game storming. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, it's the, it's the curation uh, and the continuation of what's in the book, what's on the site. So continuing to add more games writing the newsletter, um, but also more formally offering services around coaching, kind of turnkey facilitation, creating visual explanations of complicated, nuanced ideas, mm -hmm. which is where you and I have worked together mm -hmm. yeah. um, on this. And so that's where we are now. And we've got a couple of other things in the works as there are silver linings to what's going on right now with uh, with COVID and people wanting to try new things and explore new options. And um, I'm kind of excited about that. But that's mm -hmm. that's that's 10 years, I don't know, 10 years. And I think it's less than 10 minutes, but 10 years and 10 minutes. <laughs> and a few details left off the table, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Into much more yeah, detail. I don't want to bore people here. Well, that's really interesting to hear how being in the proximity of Dave and his crew doing this visual thinking, doing this game storming, two things, that it generated a book. So they basically took their operations manual and turned it into a book for other people. Mm -hmm. And then that, that was really interesting to hear that that proximity that you had to them actually influenced you to think in a similar way and to take away. It, it sort of shows that those those games and those concepts actually work, right? Because it, it worked for you. So that's really encouraging. Yeah, that, that's right, Mike. And I think, I think there's a parallel between, we call them fuzzy goals, but we say you, you need to put stuff up on the wall so people can see it, right? Mm -hmm. And I think in, in our current environment, that means whatever program you're working in, your digital whiteboard, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. even if it's something like a collaborative slide application, like a Google mm -hmm. Slides or PowerPoint, you, know, you need to make stuff visible to the team. Because when you see these other things, even if you're not, that's not your focus, it's, it's a representation, it's, it's, it's communication, but it's also processing in the background. And I think you do what you see. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so for me to see how my colleagues were working, again, whether I was specifically paying attention to the words that the facilitator was using or how they were drawing this or the, the order of the game, uh, or just, you know, kind of passing by on my way to get a coffee and just noticing like, okay, that's just the way we do things now. Right. Like <laughs> this it's just is our culture. That's just culture. Now. Um, those, those things make an impact. So whether it's, you have to put things on display and whether it's your thoughts in, mm. in a visual way, you know, and, and that's why I think sketch noting is this great compliment to game right, storming right. because it's it's visual communication and you you take your sketch note and you put it up on the wall like this is what I'm thinking about today and mm -hmm. and that's going to change or somebody might see it pass by it and might spark an idea or they might have something to add or it it might inspire a question so th there's definitely parallels there. Hmm. It's interesting you mentioned that because when I was in the office, which I haven't been for a few months. My favorite room in the office was actually when they redesigned the office, there was a corner. It was like a long, narrow room and they didn't know what to do with it. So they just slapped the door on it and it became sort of the junk, junk drawer room of the office. But I love that room because 
it's just uh, whiteboards. It was uh, whiteboards on two walls, and on the back wall, we actually put a stick board so you could hang, you know, with pins, you can hang printouts. And I was working on a very complex project for about a year, and the, the only way that I could keep track of that project was to actually map things out on the whiteboard, hang things on the wall, sticky notes on the whiteboard. And what I would, the interesting thing was, I would bring people who were related to the project if they were new to it or they were tangential and they wanted to understand. And it was so easy for me to bring them in that room and I could start at one end and go all the way around and explain the project. And people, there was somebody that came in there, I can't remember who this was, and they made the comment like, wow, it's like I'm inside your brain. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was an interesting comment um, that when you start putting things up, it is like you're making your, we're really making our thinking visible so not only for us, because we, we have like, I, I would regularly walk in there and may have some epiphany like, oh, I, that's a really interesting correlation I hadn't thought of because it was all up and spread out and I could make that correlation. And I'm, and I think for other people, they could see those connections as well, right? It's really helpful, whether it's virtual, you know, maybe it's virtual. So we're doing the same thing with other tools, but having your stuff out, I think that that's the thing I discovered too with sketch noting is it lets you get your thinking out on some substrate, paper, iPad screen, whatever. So it's not it's stuck in your head because I think when it's stuck in your head, it's less easy for us to examine it and see the connections until it gets out on something. And I think that's the maybe the connection between game storming and sketch noting is it's this concept of getting things out. Absolutely. So then you can deal with it right in. Both are, I mean, sketchnoting in a lot of ways is a game, right? The way I play it is if I go to an event, I'll do some preparation, but I try to do everything within the period that the presentation is being given and to capture as much of it as I can, right? So I've got all these little game rules that I, if I had, if I thought about them, I could probably document them and everybody has their own version of the sketchnoting game, if you, if you will. So it's kind of interesting as we talk that these ideas are coming up in my head. Yeah, you know the the, the room. There's so much in there. I wanted I wanted to address the the room. That's great. That's great. Like I, I'm I'm imagining the room that you're walking into with these whiteboards, <laughs> and and seeing it. Um, and you can see the relationships more clearly, and you can mm -hmm. see the boundaries and what's in the boundary and what's not. And then you can start to question those. Right. Mm -hmm. It's easier mm -hmm. to should we expand the boundary? Should we should we harden it? Should these other things that don't appear to be related right now, could they, should they be related? And, mm -hmm. and that's where I think you can start to iterate, which is also another reason that you need to get the thing down. Because mm -hmm. so often an idea or a concept will, will just keep going over and over in our head. And we can't move beyond it until we get it out and like V1 down on mm -hmm. the paper. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, we always say is that the first drawing is always wrong. I don't know if you right. found found this in in this kind of work, um, but you got to get it out of your head. You have to get it down on paper, and you have to go test it. You just have to give it to somebody else and see mm -hmm. what they say, because um, you need to get down on that versioning path to get the to get mm -hmm. the right thing uh, to get the right thing done. Yeah, in terms of the you know your sketch your rules for sketch noting and everybody having their own version i think that's right and i think that's true with game storming you know there's there's recipes mm -hmm. in there and when i first started with it yeah i i followed oh step one okay say this you know which is what i loved mm -hmm. about game storming because mm -hmm. it made it it made it bulletproof for me and i just felt like as somebody who didn't have this background i didn't have any kind of formal training and it. it was really nice to be able to rely on something that was so detailed and thorough but you, you develop your own your own style of it, whatever you do, right? Whether it's sketch noting, visual thinking, if you have a hobby, like you do it enough, right? You, you develop your you develop your own style, and I think what I've come to notice in in our world is there's this concept of the container, and then there's the stuff that's in the container, and I, maybe what I heard you say or. What I what in my head I heard you say is in your preparation for when you're going to go to Sketchnote, you do the things to create the shape of the container. So maybe mm -hmm. you'll do some research yeah. on the topic or the company that you're going, the organization. Um, but you don't try to fill the container right. until you get to where the Zoom meeting now, right, <laughs> or the meeting that you're going to record. And I think that's the same thing with uh, just generally facilitation, right? Mm -hmm. Your role as 
if you're going to be leading a meeting, a visual thinking meeting, you know, your role as the facilitator is to really give the shape to to whatever time it is that you're going to be spending together mm-hmm. and let the the people in the room fill it with the content and the ideas and right, the right. empathy maps and the, the, the customer journeys. And it's important to remember that too because mm-hmm. um, you can't be playing both of these roles. So again, more, more similarities between the two practices. Mm-hmm. That I think there are definitely connections there, and what you were imagining, I was saying as well. What I was saying, I do yeah, try okay. to. You know, I've talked about this before that it's better for me when I go into an environment that I have research and I have a little bit of understanding and a little preparation. Like maybe, so let's say I'm going to I'm going to listen to someone in particular speak. So I've I've looked at them. I've maybe uh, found their Twitter profile or whatever, and I've done a sketch of them so I understand what their face looks like if I want to do that. I understand where they're coming from and some of the things they've talked about. So, you know, maybe I spend an hour doing this stuff so that when I go into the room, I feel I've I've got some foundation to work from. So when they, because they're going to say things in context to their experience. So if I understand what their experience is, that means that I'll understand, hopefully, the context better. So it's just really putting myself in a better position to feel relaxed and be able and have the ability to take that information and make sense of it. So it's really like, I don't want to over prepare. Like you can over prepare sometimes. Um, Like as an example, um, when I shot videos for my book, I had everything scripted out. When I tried to read the scripts, it was so wooden and terrible. So what I found is for me, I needed bullet points of the concepts and then I can imagine them and speak to them and be very natural. So there's like this some resolution of uh, detail that's good for everybody. Everybody's a little different, right? Some people maybe need more background. Some people can wing it. I like to have some something in the middle and it just puts me in a more relaxed position to then my goal is to be in the moment and not be looking and referencing things too much or worrying that I didn't uh, do this or, or did this improperly. I just want to be in the moment. And that's sort of everything that I do is putting me in a position to do that. Well, I guess I would say. Yeah. I think part of that where you're open to it is like you're avoiding bias. If you do too much work, you can start to generate a bias and you can start to like look for things that may or may not Mm -hmm. be in the moment. And that observe that objective observation is really important Mm -hmm. in in sketch noting and in game storming going back to that concept of fuzzy goal you know putting the stuff on the wall creates momentum uh, Mm -hmm. and you've got to see where the momentum goes and if you come in with any kind of plan (laughs) any or any kind of bias you might be trying to redirect the momentum which is one of Right. And when, when I think people, when in in in, meet, in meetings uh, or in workshops, when things go sideways, I think oftentimes that's the case. Is you have to go where where the moment is taking you, where the mm-hmm. room is taking you, even if you spent a month planning the agenda <laughs> in your yeah. script. Which is one of the we recently did a we asked for advice for first time facilitators. And we Mm -hmm. made this post and we got a great response from, from a lot of the sketch in an army. Actually. I think I know I responded and other people on the sketch. Yeah. um, And I would say that the, the most common piece of advice that came back in all different versions was, you know, you have to prepare, but you also have to prepare to throw that script Mm -hmm. out the window as soon as you walk in the door, Mm -hmm. because it's all, improvisation at that point point. and mm-hmm. i think that's what you're doing when you're sketch noting and you you don't have your script and you're just like all right i'm gonna be here in the moment mm-hmm. and listening I, it's draining for me mike and i'm you know i'm yeah i'm a, i'm an amateur sketch noter I, I love the practice um i love it for as much of the meditative aspect of mm-hmm. it mm-hmm. as the Oh, it looks really good when I'm done with it. Or sometimes, sometimes it can look really good when I'm done with it. But it just, in a lot of ways, it's really draining. It's because mm-hmm. you're it, you're just being forced to listen mm-hmm. so intently to what's going on and what are the what are the key messages here, uh, and it's this distillation that it's rewarding, but it's uh, it's costly as you're going through it. 
And I would think that if you put yourself in a situation where you've done no preparation and it happens, like there's times when I go into a meeting, like I've had this happen before where I had my iPad pro, let's say, I think I had it happen at work when I was still at the office and there was a presentation and I just made the decision in the moment, like I'm going to sketch note this. This is interesting. Now I made the choice to go in there. Now, uh, if you go into a situation where you haven't prepared, um, you, the problem is, is you're trying to be present and listen and you're building the rules of the game as it's being played, which is doable. And if you're experienced, you can sort of have frameworks in place that are default. And that's what you learn over time is this is going a certain direction. Like my my default, if I'm going into a situation where maybe I really want to focus on it, I don't want to think too much about content, I'll just go to a linear format. It's like the go-to for me. And there's other people have talked about having go-to. So you start building with experience, yet you build a defaults that you do, default uh, lettering, default shapes, default color, you know, like you always have these things that you can rely on and it lets you focus on the, on the moment. Um, but I think I was, there was an image that popped in my head from a movie, an old movie called Contact with Jodie Foster. Jodie Foster, and If yeah. you remember that near the end of the movie, they build the machine, right? One gets uh, blown up and then they build another one. And so she now gets in the machine and remember that they mounted a, a chair into the machine that she sat in and then things started like vibrating and going crazy and the chair broke off the floor and suddenly she didn't need the chair, right? Like uh, in in their wisdom, the people who had built the machine did not trust that the machine was safe enough for her to be in or, a, or occupant to be in. So they added something to it, which was this chair to make you safe. But in reality, the machine was designed to not need a chair at all. So it broke it off because it was just not, it was not harmonious with the design. And then she was just free floating, right? That was the moment where everything started happening when the chair broke off. So in a lot of ways, that reminds me of like, if you go into a meeting and you try to hold too tightly to your preconceived notion of how things should go or the structure, it's almost like bolting a chair uh, to the floor and you're not letting yourself go with the flow. So, you know, try to go in there with a plan, but don't be so tied to it that you're bolting it to the floor. And that's something you learn over time. When you're starting out, I think, you know, oh, I'm going to be in front of these people. Maybe my boss is going to be in the room. And, you know, these these other people, these we'll call them stakeholders, right? Or, or, or people who may have sway over my performance review. And you get really nervous and you just mm -hmm. want to do a good job. <laughs> and um, so you just want to stick to right. the script. But over time, as you you do that, more and more, you start to realize, all right, I, the room's going over here. I'm going to scrap this part of the agenda. Mm -hmm. And you go into your your database of of what games or activities do I do? What you know for mm -hmm. the the sketch? And what's the what's the shape that this is taking on the page? Is it linear? You know, is it kind of hub and spokey? And you develop. I remember Dave said to mm -hmm. me once, and he was. I was like, oh, this is an amazing visual depiction of what we just heard in this meeting, right? We were we were creating a capture document, and mm -hmm. he said to me, you know, I just I've done this for longer than you, and I just have more more rows in the database to to draw on, and so that yeah. makes you know it's the practice and exposing yourself to new things, mm -hmm. and having them in your pocket like improvisation feels a lot like or it could look a lot like magic mm -hmm. but i think there's really a science behind mm -hmm. it yeah yep. you know like you have to really uh, you have to really understand mm -hmm. um preparation how things are working and, and understand your source materials and so you can put them together in a way that does look like magic but i really like when you know dave mm -hmm. told me about the database thing he's like yeah. i'm like yeah that makes that makes total sense you just have you have more models like visual models to to draw upon uh, and so you can pick the right yeah. one at the right time for sports fans it's a lot like i hear really um high achieving uh sports athletes will say that they, mm -hmm. that the game slows yeah. down for them have you heard that term before right so it's like they've done it enough and they've experienced enough that uh suddenly they f they almost are operating at a faster speed than everybody else. They can make decisions. They can, in the moment, they're at, it's like they're getting, yeah. basically they're getting into a flow state that Mihai Chick sent Mihai described, right? That's basically what they're doing. So that's sort of where you're aiming for. And, you know, each time you do it, you're getting closer to that. And, you know, each situation is different and you're sometimes you're tired, sometimes you're not. Like all those things can factor into it, uh, whether you're sketchnoting or running yeah. a game storm session. 
but um, all you know, very similar. You know what I realized is we uh, we never stop to describe what game storming is. I think most people have heard of it. Um, I'm going to make the assumption there's someone out there that I have never heard of game storming, but I'm really fascinated after this discussion. What exactly is a game storming? So you want to describe that now that we're a yeah, ways into the Yeah, it's probably discussion? a good idea, Mike. <laughs> uh, and this is always the, the hardest question I have to answer because hmm. it's a book. Um, it's a website. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think people, some people think of it like on the, on the same level as design thinking or a, a sprint, and it's this mm-hmm. methodology. Mm-hmm. And it is. Mm-hmm. I think of it more as a philosophy. Okay. And mm-hmm. using the book as the example, I think the book is almost exactly 200 pages. The first 50 pages of the book, it sounds like a lot. It's not. Um, I, to me, that's what game storming is, which is the philosophy of how to have mm-hmm. a meeting and how to, and how to think visually. So mm. page nine, open, explore, close. Like that to me, that, that it's the pencil shaved from both ends that mm, okay. open, explore, close. That, the dime. it's this thing that once I saw it, I couldn't stop seeing it. And it wasn't in just meetings. It was even like what we're doing here. <laughs> we're opening, we're exploring, and then we're going to close, right? Like divergent thinking, this exploration, mm-hmm. this yeah. navigation, and then convergent thinking. That happens in the conversations you have with your friends and your family. Uh, when you make small talk, you know, that's, that can be opening. A meeting follows the same pattern at work, uh, you know, an, an hour long, or it should, an hour long meeting as, as a, a, a five day workshop. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it can repeat within mm-hmm. those things. Like each game would have an open and explore close. So in a lot of ways, it's this fractal. Mm pattern that keeps happening and so i think that's one of the foundational pieces of i don't even like to call it game storming i did a good meeting like a good a, a good gathering yeah now there are other things that make game storming game storming i've, I've mentioned fuzzy goals right so going in and mm-hmm. making sure that as you are having your meeting you're documenting things and you're having people draw and it doesn't mean it, this mm-hmm. is not this it's ideas not art right um it's stick figures in text mm-hmm. in arrows and maybe some writing is bigger than others to indicate priority or importance but we need to put that up on the wall mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then you share and then you go back and maybe there's one of the patterns that i think also makes game storming effective in this way that it gets everybody in the room to participate I call it this parody of participation mm. is mm. every time we we do something we start a new a new game we give time for an individual brainstorm right so think of the, think of the problem what are all the what are all the aspects of the, what questions do you have about the problem we're trying to address right mm. you don't we don't it's, this is not a shout out like just write it down on a sticky or just get your thoughts, get your thoughts down. Then you share it with your table and everybody goes around and shares it with their table. And then we might, okay, develop a concept or draw this as a group, you know, put this together. But, um, and then we share it as a room. And it's that individual group room pattern that I think creates this participation because mm, you, okay. you know, one of the, one of the biggest complaints about meetings is one or two or a small group of people tend to dominate the conversation and that right so you have to you have to worry right. about the different personality right. types you have to take into account the the hierarchy that's in the room so i've mentioned open explore close this concept of fuzzy goals drawing creating this momentum and following the momentum there's other things that a game stormer does you got to try something new in in every in every setting. Keep expanding that database of different models of of, mm-hmm. of different mm-hmm. different fonts um, of different ways to draw something a, a different game to explore, uh, mm-hmm. and that's something that you know. I think you develop your your core. Like I certainly know that I have a core set of games when I go to facilitate something, and so um, I've been doing trainings recently, and it's really good as these people who are new and they have fresh eyes to game storming and they're mentioning games like, Oh, it was, it happened um, a couple of weeks ago. Somebody wanted to do the four C's. I was like, what is the four C's? Like I've never, 
and you know i had to flip through the book to find it um but you should always be doing <laughs> new yeah. things because it, it'll slightly tweak the the take um it maybe even it's the same result you'd use it as the same time in the workshop but you might get different results or it might spark a new thought so yeah to me game storming is this is this philosophy is this approach to to really mm. it can be anything and there are ingredients but i would say it's not formulaic you know the Hmm. I, I was thinking about this. It applies to work. It can apply to anything that you're doing. You can quote unquote game storm it, which I've always felt is just a better way of working. Not it, it doesn't have to be relegated to a hmm. workshop or to a meeting, right? You don't have to have this formality around it. Um, it can be used really at any time. I've even used it outside of work. I've done empathy maps for personal relationships. You know, it, it's a really great way to hmm. understand another person in your life. Um, so I think it can be applied anywhere. Maybe I'm a little biased. It's informal in that way where it, it's, it's not so like step one, step two, step three. It, it, so it's an art. I think a lot of it is, is mm -hmm. an art more so than a, a, a science. Sounds like a lot of emphasis on principles. And like you said, the first 50 pages are the principles of why you do it and how, why you would do it a certain, like what the structure is because you know, there's recipes from page 51 till, you know, 200 of ways to take that philosophy and apply it. But the point is that you get almost That's like right. a game storming mindset, it seems like, right? Where you can, now you're just looking for opportunities to apply. I, my dad always talked about my grandfather would always make everything into a game. Like how many, how many corns can I shuck before dinner? Like who, who could do the most corn, right? Or like any, it could be anything. It didn't even matter. And I know I find myself doing that. Uh, sometimes with myself, like how fast can I walk the dog around or how many whatevers can I see before I get back? Or like when you're on a, you're on a road trip as a kid, like, can you build the alphabet one letter at a time by looking yeah. at the sides of trucks and signs and, you know, like all those are, those are kind of game storm games. It's just the way humans, like even ancient humans, uh, dealt with life, right? We would make games out of things. It's a natural expression. It's almost like just the way we operate. So you're basically tapping into a natural way of being and you're just providing structure around the, the philosophy and giving some recipes to sort of show you here's how it could be applied. Now go do these things and you're going to discover either variations on those formulas or those recipes or you're making new recipes altogether, right? That's right. Yeah, I think that's great, Mike. I remember um, on our road trips, my father would we would see how many uh, different states license plates we could find on the on the highway, which was one of those games. Uh, yeah. And I think, you know, oh, game storming, does it mean like you gamify things? And I think there's a couple different uh, definitions people think of when they hear gamify. Mm -hmm. You know, this isn't, I always go back to, you know, Farmville or Mafia Wars from... <laughs> Right, where they would they would create <laughs> these incentives for you to play the game more, right? Yeah. What we mean by a game is that there is a there's a field of play. So what's inbounds or what's out of bounds, right? Now any game you can think of has a has a game board, whether it's mm -hmm. baseball or chess or the empathy map, right? So you've got your you got your field of play, then you've got your list of materials and instructions, and you've got your supplies. So those three things in game storming, of course, was always intended mm. to be to be played with whatever you've got mm -hmm. in your supply closet down the hall. Now it's your home office. Whatever you've got, mm. like you can you can do this. You don't need any special tools. Which is another thing that I feel game storming is great at is really democratizing this creative process. You know, anybody can do this, and I think it's represented mm. in just the way the material is presented in the book. This is for anybody who feels they are that lower C creative and they just want to be more creative with work. It's not just relegated to mm -hmm. the designers or that we have a creative department or we have an innovation department for that. No, this is something that you can do in accounting, you know, if, if you want to. Um, mm -hmm. There's really no boundary on where it can be applied, which is, I think is why it spoke to me so early on. It's like, I've always wanted to do these things, and this just seems mm -hmm. really an approachable way to learn how to do that. Mm. That's really interesting. Very interesting. So you said you do services now. 
around this. So you, I, I imagine that means you teach people how to do it or you run meetings and walk people through this uh, philosophy and or tell me a little bit about what it is that you do now. And then I'd love sure. to hear like where you think it's going in the future. People have always written in. And I think training has always been the number one thing that there has been a request for. Like, how do I get trained? How do I get certified in this? Mm -hmm. um, so we're offering our own take on that. Um, it, it's not a certification mm -hmm. program yet. And, and I think there's some things we wanted to avoid um, with certification versus taking more of like an apprenticeship yeah. approach and working with somebody who is very well versed mm -hmm. in, in game storming. Um, in learning it that way, we say, you know, you have to see one, then you do one, then you teach one. And that's the approach that we want to take with it. So a lot of it, it is around one-to-one um, -one coaching or facilitation. There are people who just want to be more creative at work to help me. You know, I know they, they can't put their finger on it, but they know that something is wrong or something can be better with what's happening at work mm. in their group. They're doing things. I'm trying to you know, remember the quotes from what people are saying. It's like, I just, I know we're doing things in old way or a wrong way. And I know that they can be better. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we show them what a game storming. And they're like, oh, I want that. You know, that's what I want. And that's why the, the pictures mm -hmm. are, are great when they see what goes on. They're like, yes, we need, we need something like that. Um, so there's, yes, there's mm -hmm. coaching, uh, individual group. Uh, facilitation, of course, kind of turnkey where we'll, we'll do the facilitation mm -hmm. for the meeting or the workshop. Um, auditing services. Uh, that's another one where mm. different organizations offer workshops or it's, it's an integral part of their business model. And whether it's now they have to worry about it being virtual and how do you make a good engaging virtual mm. Right. Yeah. Um, but even, even, you know, before there was such a, a an emphasis on virtual, it was that same request. How can we make these better? Like this is our service offering and we know it can be better. How can we make it more game storming, -y, more engaging, more clarifying. Um, and mm -hmm. then, and I've got this on the site. Do you remember the show, the A team, Mike? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. So I don't know if you remember the opening. But the, the intro to the A-Team was, um, you know, if you have a problem, if nobody else can help, and if you can find them, maybe you can hire the A-Team. And so a <laughs> lot of the work has been about that. It's somebody writing in and saying, like, I don't, it's not exactly this, or it's not exactly that, or I have this thing coming up, I have this event, or, you know, we've got a pop-up fair, or I want to make a game that I can play with my users at a conference, but I don't know how to make a game. And so it's, yeah, it doesn't fall mm -hmm. into one of the other categories, but right. we, we do it, right? So it's the, it's the A-team. We can help you with a problem that you don't know who else you can, you can turn to with. Hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. we'll at least get you we'll, started we'll help you on it and like in That's defining right. it, right? Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, we've done, we've made card decks, we've made, we've made games, we've designed pop-up fairs and, and that's, that's really fun mm. for me because it's just making a very mm. specific concrete thing out of this amorphous idea. So, um, and, and we, I just published them on the site because we hadn't had them before. It was always, I, ha I wasn't advertising. Like I, I wanted to leave people alone. Like, you know, you're coming to the site and I wanted to, I wanted to respect mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I also think there's, there's a benefit for having if, if people want these things and they're curious about them, I, again, enough people have requested them that I felt comfortable putting it on the site because if, mm. if a few people are requesting, I'm assuming there are more who, who are also interested. Yeah. 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 Educators right now, they're going through, they're facing. Oh um, yeah. And this is something, yeah, we've worked together on this and I'd love to do more of it. Uh, yeah. Getting ready for the school year. I don't know when this is going to get published. Maybe by the time it's out, it will have already passed, but that is definitely one thing um, that, that we're working on. Mm -hmm. uh, certain types of education, project-based learning, they're game storming. They're game storming in the classroom and that's how they're teaching kids how to learn. And, and mm -hmm. yeah. That's good. Um, another thing we have going on, and this is, I, I mentioned earlier on about this experimentation and people having time and wanting to try new things. We're, um, we're about to launch a, a, a research project. Oh, really? 
Yeah, around um, around facilitation, virtual facilitation. So this was something that was essentially both the idea and the team were crowdsourced from the game storming community, and we're about to launch a survey to, as the first phase of this of this research. And mm -hmm. I'm as I'm interested in it as much from the model of putting the team together as it is as I am for the the results of the survey. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. Sounds like you've got a lot going on, Dave. <laughs> Which is great. It's great to hear that you're applying this in so many ways. Yeah. Th thanks. Thanks, Mike. The community, it's, it's just such an engaging and such a supportive community. And I, I mean, I think our communities overlap quite a bit. Yeah, I think so too. And, you know, people just want to, they want other people to experience, I think, the, either the joy, the productivity, the engagement that they get from thinking visually and it, and it, it creates a lot of, um, it creates a great, a great atmosphere and a great culture around doing this work. So it's, mm. it's very rewarding. Mm. And I think we want to grow it. Well, it's uh, great for you to share that because I think there's lots of sketch noters who maybe can start getting turned on to this and applying it and making use of it. So that's encouraging to me to see these more actively overlapping and crossing into each other's spaces. And uh, I think that's, that's a really healthy thing for sure. Yeah, it, you know, it go, going either way, um, <laughs> crossing over, and, and it's it's more it's uh, another skill set. Either either one, right? Mm -hmm. As you as you add to it, it's another it's another skill to add, um, and they're they're extremely complementary. And this is the time to be learning those skill sets when you've you know things are shifting for everybody, right? It's not like you know one area is impacted; it's the whole world being impacted all at once, which is a strange phenomenon that we haven't seen in our lifetimes right right it's, typically it's regional but this is this is uh international it's worldwide so it's an opportunity to reset in some ways and start new things so this uh it's good that you're um you're here to help people to do that if they want to yeah and these these things translate very easily online you know, this is not mm. just an in-person, well, if I don't have a physical wall to put a sticky up on, I can't, I can't mm -hmm. do these things. Um, these, they, yeah, they translate very well online. That's really good, especially in the remote world that we're at least currently living in. I wanted to go in a little different direction. You said the, the beauty of game storming is it can kind of use the the supply closet that you have available. Yeah. Um, so, however... That being said, you know, you can use ballpoint pens and sticky notes or whatever is available or a sheet of paper, which I like. I love that when I do workshops now. All I roll in with is a ream of paper and a box of flare pens. That's all I need and somewhere to display my iPad, right? I try to pare it down to about as minimal as you can get away with. Um, and I think that uh, because you're using really basic tools, it frees up people to not focus on the tools. Mm -hmm. However, I would imagine over time you've grown to find certain tools that you like and um, our community loves discovering new tools and it seems like every time somebody comes on the show I discover some new thing that I hadn't heard of before or hadn't thought of for a while so are there tools that you like maybe we'll start with analog and then switch to digital yeah and you know you've got latitude to talk about maybe there's tools uh, since we're talking about game storming like what are the tools that you like for that uh, when you get to digital but what about analog because so many of us have these where so here's my thinking is we're so digitized now, which is okay, but I think there's still a place for analog work with yourself. There is, Mike, even with teams. I think even with the teams when you're doing these things, and I just said, um, you know, these games translate so well online. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of what we try to bring in and it is continuing to do the analog thing because uh, I think there's just something so creative, uh, it is so energizing about, pen and paper and that feel, that mm -hmm. friction that you get from the two meeting and just drawing without anything really in between you. And I, and I would consider, a, you know, as great as the, the a tablet is and a stylus are and all the cool things that you can do with, with a digital drawing program, it's just really nice to be able to have a nice stock of index card and a, and mm -hmm. a good pen and, and draw mm -hmm. on it. So, you know, you asked me, I, I don't know that I'm going to enlighten anybody who's listening to this <laughs> with some like deep technical or, you know, in this corner of the internet, I discovered uh, something because 
again, I, I think you picked up on the like the the pathos of game storming is to keep it low tech. And even mm-hmm. when we do um, like the online stuff, again, I still be, because the tech can be a barrier. You know, people know how to work their camera phone and they know mm-hmm. how to draw a piece of paper. So I, I try to u- incorporate that as much as possible. And I, it, it helps with creativity too. Like the more constraint you have, you know, you could use Miro, you could use Mural and they have all the bells and whistles, but I think there's going to be a huge learning curve there. And yeah. I th- also think you might not be as creative as you would be or come up with the solution if you just said, you know what, I'm, we're going to do everything today uh, with pen and paper and a camera phone and, you know, maybe Google Slides, some kind of collaborative document mm-hmm. where you can put all this stuff. Somewhere to, to put the stuff, right, when yeah. you take a photo of it. So here, I'm just going to, I'm looking at, right now, I'm looking at my kind of supply closet that I have in my in my office <laughs> here, and I'll just run through what I have, and you, okay. you can tell me what the audience might be interested in. So I... Um, I, I I love this is a five by eight. Oh, the big cards. Interesting. Five by eight index. Um, yes. Cards. Love these. They're great. I actually, from Staples, I have these index card. Uh, uh, can you see them? Right. Yeah, th- yeah. These. And so a lot of times what I'll do is instead of a notebook, I will, it's, it's almost like a recipe box again with, without the video mm. um, that I put these in. And so, I just like going back and going through all of the different things. Oh, the sketch noting handbook. Look at this. I started. Oh yeah, look at that. Yeah, I think I started doing some of the exercises and like let's draw letters, Joe, and there's Joe. Um, so I like to I like to um, so it's not bound in a notebook, but it, there's okay. Uh, okay. I found them on Amazon. It wasn't a uh, like a big. It wasn't Staples or Office Depot. It was um, I, I think I searched for like heavy sock, and these are really nice. They won't bleed through. Mm-hmm. And they're they're unruled on both sides. Okay. I have a stack of five hundred, and whenever I have a new meeting, I just grab another one and I I take notes on that. Mm, um, okay. So I uh the I have a bigger format. I I bought some A three paper, eleven by seventeen. Okay. Yep. And when that's in front of you, I, I you can draw bigger. It it's it's kind of, it's freeing. Mm. right from the five by eight and i i think these moleskin notebooks are essentially five by eights right um, yep so are my um sketch idea books they're five <laughs> five by eight yeah yeah basically a5 is roughly in that that size yeah. so yeah um if i'm trying to work out an idea i, I love getting out the 11 by 17 and that's mm. that's a nice format so okay like, i've we've talked about two paper types as my, you know, right. my, my high tech tools. I, I see lots of tape. I see I, tape painters, on your wall. Painters tape, Mike. <laughs> yep. Yep. I see that blue painters tape. Yeah. Um, yeah. You can turn any wall into a template and not worry about the paint mm. coming off. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you can, you can, it's really easy to make a two by two diagram with this. We talked mm-hmm. about game boards to make your, your game boundary with just some, um, some painters tape. It comes in handy for lots of different things i've run into mm-hmm. the office from the kitchen to like label something that i've made and put the expiration date on it you know um and you can get different widths on that too right yeah that, thin, that actually one's, very wide. i think is like two inches i, I mm-hmm. too wide the pens i think uh, this is a fairly common pen that i use uh is it the statler permanent lumicolor oh yeah oh yeah yep i've seen those yeah it's a the permanent ink. Yeah, I love the like the blotches it makes. Sometimes when I press too hard and maybe it bleeds mm. through in a piece of notebook it paper. Yeah, it gives it this nice, um, I guess, worn kind of look <laughs> for some of your drawings. It gives it more texture. Um, mm. You know, digitally, I think I, maybe even I picked this up from you. I, I use concepts. Um, I was okay. using Sketchbook for a mm-hmm. while, but I, I really like concepts. And that's what I've been using to do my to do my sketches. Do you tend to use the infinite canvas? Do you kind of constrain yourself, and you like the ability, of like I, I would think, being able to pick up objects and move them and make changes? That's great. Yeah, it's, things it's, like yeah. things like duplicating images, things like even adding uh, shadow, like to mm. to duplicate mm-hmm. the lettering and then put it on you know a layer behind to create the, the shadowing look or something. Yeah, th- that's where things. There's some really cool things you can do with these these digital drawing tools. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't found that I've used on that the infinite canvas much. So I mm-hmm. I use Miro the 
the digital whiteboard. Yeah. And on that, I've used the infinite canvas. I think it comes default if I, we've been using it as well. And it sort of comes with a default infinite canvas. And then you do these frames. Like if you need to frame something, you can add a frame that defines space. Yes. And that also comes in handy on the export because when you export mm. your canvas, every frame is a slide. Yeah. It loses a lot of the context because mm-hmm. I think part of the reason that we use these digital whiteboards is to see the relationships to other things. Mm-hmm. But it is really nice that you can frame. And I also, if you have enough frames, um, if your board's really cluttered, it's a great navigation tool mm-hmm. to, go, yep. to go through in the frames. Mm-hmm. But I really like something that I've noticed is all of the software, two things. Uh, one, drawing gets eliminated. I think the software has this bias yeah. for, for text. Yeah. And look, there's plenty. We use sticky notes all the time and we have people write on sticky notes. Uh, but I think you have to be really deliberate about drawing in these, but also leaving what we call the rough edge of creation. You know, yeah. um, when you, when you leave a workshop, there's crumpled up sticky notes, things crossed out. There's none of that in the, you just delete the thing or you rewrite Everything. it. And, and everything's perfect and there's a tendency it's to make aligned, it line up. And all yeah. the lines are straight and then the same width. And I think it loses some texture and it loses some mm-hmm. character there. Yeah. So it can sterilize things. And, yeah. and I think that's something that the reason I use the infinite canvas in, in Miro, I mean, I could, I, we could go back and we can, you know, align all of the sticky notes so they're like a perfect mm-hmm. grid. I would rather just let it be because it reminds me of the moment Mm. and how things were generated and i just want to i want to spread things out if we need to we can we can arrange some things but i'd like to let them grow more organically than having like this is the perfect path that we used in this meeting yeah let it be as it is kind of yeah yeah um Mm. not everything translates from an offline to an online world and i think you know trying to force it could could be wrong but i I think there is um a benefit to to like the digital version of the, the, the stops and starts in the crumpled up sticky. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I suppose the solution with those online tools, whether it's Miro or Mural, and we'll have links to those. They're two, unfortunately, very similarly named tools that are very similar yeah. in their feature sets. Um, both, both are effective. I think um, I suppose one way to do it is to, like you said, maybe you make people work locally with pens and paper and then, put photos in the board and you move the photos around, right? So it's got that, it brings a little bit of that rough edge to it mm-hmm. and you don't get so, um, sedu- almost like seductive to use the tools on the, on the, on the tool itself. And there, like you said, it sort of eliminates drawing because it's hard. Like if you try to draw with your mouse, it's terrible. Oh yeah. I think if I, if I log in with my iPad or something, I can probably do it, but not everybody's got an iPad pro and a pencil. Nobody's right? got so a now sense. Yeah. My, it's, it's not very democratic, uh, democratic yeah for people to participate equally so yeah the mouse and the keyboard are on another another level of use than Mm -hmm. the at this point the lowly stylus you know and and i wonder with our work from home if that's going to change will will it catch up yeah but it's uh, i mean i don't think it's it's going to unfortunately um that's a pretty good materials list i would say Um, all right pretty low tech mike (laughs) that's okay and i remember i was in philly teaching a workshop and we had ordered um paper and so the person actually got cardstock and cut them in the five by eight and i just remember like loving that size it was just the perfect yes. size even though it was smaller than typically i the reason i choose like printer paper is because it's easy to get and it's cheap uh-huh. and you know like a ream of paper is like five bucks or something right. so anybody can provide it so but this person was a little step ahead and she got the index paper and had it cut into five by eight and it was really easy to work with especially in that setting because they had it was sort of a theater with those fold out desks that you'd see in a university setting it was drexel university okay. so it actually fit better on the little tables that flopped out because they're not real huge they're not really designed <laughs> i don't think they're designed to actually write on they're used i think they tend to be used for laptops mostly so that size is really good and then the combination with that and the flare was a really good combo so i kind of remembered that people commenting actually students commenting oh i really like this paper Can it makes I you want to draw yeah yeah so people were taking chunks of the paper home because I didn't want to carry it back with me. So uh, that was pretty fun. Yeah, nice paper. Nice paper is nice. Maybe um, I need to do uh, sketchnote idea book uh, index cards in different sizes, you know, with our beautiful paper that uh, 
Yeah. That people can use. That could be an interesting product. I hadn't thought about that. Well, um, I'm gonna sh- <laughs> I'm gonna shift a little bit yeah. again and go into the three tips portion of the discussion. I've sort of prepared you a little bit. The framing is that someone's into sketch noting. They feel like they're excited. They want to learn more. They're excited to learn more, and they're looking for wisdom from someone who's done game storming and visualization probably longer than they have. So, what what are three things that you can share? It can be philosophy. It can be super practical with uh, someone who's listening. So the first thing, and this is this has only come to me recently as a as as my own observation is mm-hmm. um, is to be bored. There's a hustle culture out there that goes in the opposite direction, and it gives you the impression that you should never be bored, that you should always be doing something. But I've always found my insights have come when I don't know I was doing something that I never thought would be considered productive on a walk, even in in the city or in the woods, um, or just, just sitting in my room with no TV, no phone in my hand and just kind of daydreaming and thinking. And I think it's really important and, um, underrated. I think it's especially like, okay, now with all of the added pressure, like we're still in a pandemic. And I think even Mm -hmm, though we're, mm -hmm. I don't know, uh, six or seven months into it, I think people forget that. Mm-hmm. Um, or maybe more recently I've noticed, but, but yeah, it's, it's okay to like decompress and be bored. And I think that that plays into maybe it's like one a, which is the observation. Just, just observe things objectively. We talked about this in the preparation for meetings, right? Whether you're sketch noting, you're going to game storm. You've got to pay attention to what's going on in the room. So I think a lot of great things uh, whether they are philosophies or uh, ideas at work, big or small, they come from an observation that that has just been objective. And I think if you are if you just detach a little bit, then uh, you can observe things kind of as they are. And I think that's a really important, a really important starting point. And then visualize it to take those observations and, and visualize it. So if one is be bored and observe things, you know, visualizing, build your database. I, I, I think this is probably has some overlap with practice, but one of the things that I find that I do, and I'll, <laughs> I'll show you, I imitate people, you know? So uh, I don't know if you can tell whose style that is. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's yours. Looks like, looks like my style. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> I guess it, it's kind of practice and it's, you know, do it every day. But what the only way that I've found that I've gotten better is to find other people and try to analyze their style. Like mm-hmm. take what mm-hmm. they do. You know, it, I found what you do, Mike. You um, you draw in like a very iconic way, meaning less is more. I think you've mm-hmm. got um, you know fewer strokes. They're broader than, uh, or, or and even like the shadowing. I notice like they're very distinct lines, to, almost more to represent like the shadow or just some depth than it actually is to create all of the shadow that the image is actually, it would be creating in real life. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I look at Yuri and I look at Yuri's style too. And I notice how he, um, he fills in and highlights things and he's got a, a, a different style of course. So I think if you find other people, you've got to build your database of styles. And, and the best way to do that is to really reverse engineer what it is they're doing. The width of the pen, it, it helps if you know, you're sitting across from them at breakfast and you can see them <laughs> right, actually <laughs> doing the drawing. Um, and I did that on the train ride home, is why it's a little shaky. But um, so yeah, I think um, you know, practice through a- analysis really. And then I would say this. So the third thing then is to try new styles. I remember uh, there's a guy, uh, Bill Kagey, who was at Explain. He became one of my colleagues back in that the origin story from the beginning of the episode. And I remember that um, he developed this beautiful slide template at work. And I loved it. I'm like, oh, this is just so amazing. I'm so glad we did this. You know, Bill does more than slide templates. He's, he's amazing. But, at, you know, um, and I remember he had this particular style. And then one day... I saw the slide template. I went to go get, you know, start another presentation. I saw the slide template and I was like, oh, I changed it. I don't know, like what happened, you know? And it was 
it was just as great. I just didn't like the change. But one of the things I've realized only recently is that that is what people who are good at what they do do, which is they're constantly getting out of their rut and changing the way that they, they try something new and they change the way that they do things. And it's one of the, the, the tenets of game storming, which is in every workshop, you've got to try something new. So be bored, practice through analysis and try new things all the time. Those are my three, those are my three things. Oh man, that's, that's so good, Dave. Thanks. Thanks for sharing those thoughts. And, um, I think we're at the point now where people will want to reach out to you and find out more, uh, either to talk with you about working with you or just to find all the stuff that you've been working on so they can be inspired and apply it. So tell us a little bit about, um, how people can get in contact with you. Sure. Uh, we can have, I guess, links to this in the show notes, but yep. Mm -hmm. Dave M at gamestorming.group email, my, my Twitter handle, of course, V Z R J V Y. There's a story behind that. But we'll, we'll, nobody remembers that, so we'll link to that. Um, <laughs> you can go, go to gamestorming.com and look at what's there. Um, there's a contact us form. So, Tons of resources. Yeah, there's an email the, newsletter. There's, yeah, you'll be prompted for, to sign up for the newsletter. Look at the games. We keep adding to the game library. Uh, the best way to stay up on that is to subscribe to the newsletter. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And again, yeah, there's a contact us form. If you just want to say hi, you have a question about something, um, we're happy to answer any and all inquiries. And I know that you're on the Sketchnote Army Slack channel. So I am. If people are people are there. You can find what's your handle there. Is it just Dave? I think Dave Mastronardi. I think I use that VZRJVY all over okay. the place. But yeah, if okay. you, I think if you if you um, you search, search your name, there, you'll find Dave Mastronardi. Yeah. yeah, I'll be in there too. Yeah, the maestro we call him in the biz. <laughs> well, thanks for being on the show, Dave. It's been really fun to discuss game storming and give people sort of a taste of it. I think uh, when sketchnoters and visual thinkers get a taste of it, they'll want more. I know I do. I enjoy it. And it's a good way to give structure to the stuff that you want to achieve in your life. I mean, whether it's personal or, or professional. So thanks for just making time to share with us, Dave. Of course, Mike. And uh, thank you for having me. And uh, thank you for all the help that you've given me both professionally and, and, and personally. I really appreciate yeah. the relationship. Well, you're you're so welcome. You you know all the best places in New York City to go for <laughs> Korean oh, barbecue. I see, so. I see. <laughs> I, you know, I know who to go to. You're the go-to guy. That's right, that's right. Whenever when everything's open again, we're, we're going yeah, to have some you, Korean barbecue, man. That's right, we will, we will. All right, thanks a lot. And uh, with that, we'll wrap the show and we'll talk to you again in the next episode of the Sketch and Army podcast. The Sketchnote Army podcast was created by me, Mike Rohde, and brought to you by Road Design Studios. It's produced and edited by Alec Polianis of Amp Creative Studios. The theme music was created by John Schiedemeyer. To support the creation of this show, I invite you to buy one of my books, The Sketchnote Handbook or The Sketchnote Workbook. You can find the books on Amazon or go to peachpit.com and use the code RODI40 for 40% off. Please share this podcast with other visual thinking friends and be sure to leave a nice rating on iTunes or your favorite podcast listening app so others can find the show.